Welcome to the final episode of Disera Media Literacy, the radio series that aims to educate and empower listeners to navigate the media landscape in a critical and informed way. So first we'll recap the key points from the training course. In the past seven episodes, we've covered a wide range of topics on media literacy, from understanding the importance of media literacy in today's world, to understanding how media works, evaluating the credibility of news and information, protecting ourselves from disinformation online, digital literacy and online safety, media literacy in an age of social media and media literacy and civic engagement. We've provided tips and strategies to help you navigate the media landscape with a critical and informed lens. So what are the future developments in the fight against disinformation? Positive strategies in the fight against disinformation are being implemented in Europe with the signing of, in 2022, the Strengthened Code of Practice on Disinformation which is described by the European Commission as follows. The new code brings together a more diverse range of stakeholders than ever, empowering them to contribute to wide-ranging improvements by signing up to precise commitments relevant to their field. Such commitments include demonetising the dissemination of disinformation, guaranteeing transparency of political advertising, enhancing cooperation with fact checkers and facilitating researchers' access to data. These developments are encouraging, but as individuals we need to take responsibility for our own online activities and engagement. Media literacy is not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing process. It's important to continue learning, stay informed and engage in critical thinking. We encourage you to take what you've learned from this series and apply it to your daily life. Remember to fact check information, be critical of the sources and seek out diverse perspectives. There are many resources available to help you continue your media literacy journey. Here are a few. There are fact-checking websites such as Snopes, factcheck.org and Politifact. Media literacy organisations such as the Centre for Media Literacy, the Pointer Institute, the Media Literacy Project and many more which you can find links to on our website. Media literacy education resources such as Media Smarts, MediaWise and the News Literacy Project. We hope you found this series informative and helpful. Thank you for listening to Disra Media Literacy. Remember to stay informed, stay curious and stay media literate. OK, um, so in our final lessons, we discussed the key points from over the past seven sessions. Um, and in that, we also looked at the regulations being introduced to strengthen the code of practice on disinformation. How important do you think it is to have a code of practice? Oof. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think I think that it's essential to uh, it's really essential to, to, to do that. I think um, one of the difficulties is that we're in such a changing landscape that um, you're trying to future proof stuff. You're trying to put in codes of practice that that, um, you know, are for things that you might not be able to even envisage now, you know. So I think it's important to have something that that can be revisited, you know, something that's agile and that can be reshaped and revisited. I think it's really important to have um, some sort of um, a body in place that is constantly looking at this and constantly seeing what's coming down the line and, and seeing the dangers that, that are there. Um, and I think we see that we we had the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland um, for the last good number of years and uh, they were responsible for um, 
uh, you know, advertising. Um, if somebody had a complaint about advertising, they went to the BAI. Uh, they were in, they were about licensing radio stations like this one or TV stations, all of that kind of thing. Um, and they've just completely now had to change. And we now have Commission uh, Naman, which is the the Media Commission of Ireland, mm -hmm. to take in this entire whole uh, landscape now of social media and. I think one of the things with um, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland is they were, they were dealing with radio and they were dealing with television. Um, now, now you've got this incredible online space where uh, it's almost like radio and television are the two ears on, on the outside of the head. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so that's going to be a very, uh, very interesting space um, to watch. Um, and they're the ones, I think, who have this task on hand in Ireland, um, mm. at least. So... Um, uh, I think there are some some very good people uh, at work in there, so uh, I, I I'm I'm hopeful that that uh, but I don't envy them, <laughs> you know. Our job, Fiona. Well, I agree with uh, everything Declan said, and one of the things I I used to do was I used to teach um, social media to parents and teachers, particularly in relation to cyberbullying, awareness of it, what it is, how to prevent it, how to keep their kids safe, because the kids themselves they're too young to really understand what could they, to maybe. Uh, but anticipate that bullying can happen and then when it happens what to do about it so the idea is to try and protect people by uh, uh, parents are if they get education in social media they're going to be capable of offsetting it to some point at um, being able to anticipate it so it was, it was those kind of tips and one of the things that we I taught was have a code of conduct with your kids and have a have a policy in place with your kids, how long they can have their phones for or tablets for during the day, uh, what platforms they can be on, uh, a whole load of things like this. And if they break the rules, the consequences are in the policy. So if they break the rules and, for example, go onto a platform they're not supposed to be on, they have to do, deal with consequences, which might be giving up their phone for a day or a week. Uh, which, is, as we know, is a very long time for kids. Yeah. They can't even survive five minutes without them. Um, and it's it's all of that kind of thing. It teaches them responsibility mm -hmm. uh, and, and consequences in terms of social media. It's not just something to play with. There are serious consequences based on the way it's used, based on the risks associated with it. So having this this policy makes the kids take responsibility as well as the adults. And everyone is safer and everyone uses it better. Yeah, that's very... Um, like it's something um, that I think, you know, it's, it, it needs to be done. I, I noticed as well some of the work I've done in schools um, a lot of the children know more about mm. digital media than yeah. the teachers. So it's very hard for them to actually know what um, yeah. the children are are doing on social media. Well, you know? it, it, you know, I think we saw something very interesting uh, mm. lately where um academia and the school system was starting to look at uh, moving away from um, moving away from exams and looking instead at continual assessment and there was a lot of um, enthusiasm for that uh, and then all of a sudden along came artificial intelligence and, and chat GPT uh, where you can literally just say write me a 5,000 word essay on whatever and it does it you know mm. um, and then all of a sudden they've had to backpedal and say no we need the exams where they can't bring you know they can't bring the computer into the exam because we need to uh, we need to know that they actually have learned stuff in their brain and they're not just um, relying on on artificial intelligence, you know. So, um, I th I think it's a it's a very interesting um place for you know. And I think, you know, we talked about uh, how agile young people are with technology. And I think for older people, um, I think that's a really really uh good combination. Um, I think you know you have people who have lived. A lifetime where they've learned a lot of stuff mm. and it's the stuff you can't read in books it's stuff that you learn from from living a lifetime and then at the other end of that generational um reality you have young people who are so quick with all of this and they don't get fooled as easily and you know they have the savvy when it comes to the tech and they can recognize the fakes more easily and all of that kind of thing they're less gullible um, mm. about this in this space and i think there's a beautiful marriage between you know the the uh, the older 
demographic and the younger demographic if we find some way of getting them all to chat with each other so that the the older people can can give their wisdom and the younger people can give their savvy uh, and together you know kind of navigate this this whole world and i suppose those those in that middle space <laughs> <laughs> can can uh, you know can can maybe facilitate that, you know yeah. Uh, That's, yeah that intergenerational thing I think is so important because younger people have so much um to learn um and you know I laughed at the first time I I you know I um you know I, I had a an got a turntable a, a record player and when I went to lift the the hand look to put it on the record my um, girls were going like what are you doing you know, do, you know do you not just press a button and you know it, like they just couldn't fathom it but you know there's so much history and so much um, you know that we oh, as older people have um, that we can offer and we can teach and yet we have so much to learn as well so it's that interaction and um, just as we're coming to the end of this series you know what would be your main tips for navigating um, the social media or world or protecting yourself that you would give to the listeners? Um, My big takeaway for for media literacy and protecting yourself and making sure that, that everything you consume is accurate is question everything. Like when I worked in a newsroom, we got press releases in, we got tips on Twitter and I would never take it as true until I had checked it out, until I got a second a credible source. And when I say credible source, there are some websites who just take news as it comes out and repeat it. So that's not a second credible source. You need to get it from two independent sources. So you've got to check that out. And I would never put something out until I had checked it out uh, thoroughly. And anyone who has kids will know that kids go through a certain stage where they ask why. So why do I have to go to school? Because you need an education. But why? Yeah. Because you need to get an education to get a job. But why? Yeah. And then, you you know, you, the more they ask why, the more you're kind of struggling to come up with answers. But that's what you need to do on social media. You need to constantly be saying why, why, why or what? You know, question what something is. Is it accurate? Is the person who's trying to connect with me who they say they are? Is this connection with this person going to benefit me or not benefit me? And also, why am I on social media? What do I want from it? Am I getting what I want from it in terms of protecting mental health? How do I feel after I've used social media? If I go on and I see everyone being really successful and really happy, and I, am I going to come away feeling worse about myself? So mm. people do need to assess how they feel after using social media and all those other questions about protecting themselves. There, there was a time where every time I went on social media, um, I was coming away feeling really angry and frustrated and nowhere to vent that. And, um, you know, it, I really found that I had to you know, block a number of accounts or remove myself um, just for my mental health. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it can, it, you, you know, you can be emotionally swayed in any direction. Um, so I totally agree with what you're saying there, Fiona. Declan. What was the question? <laughs> um, I'm just saying any, no, any I, tips I think, for our listeners. Yeah, yeah no, I, th I think the big tip, the, the big tip that I would have um, uh, and, and I, I, I listened, I can't remember who it was, but I listened to somebody and, and when they said this, I thought, oh, my God, they're right. You know, uh, a, a lot, a lot of the scams and a lot of the people who are trying to um, you know, bring bring you somewhere that that, that they want um, with the information, uh, they invest a sense of urgency about it. So it's if you don't act within the next fifty seconds, you lose you lose the special offer. If you um I, if if you don't send me the money now, I I will you know. There's always a because what they're trying to do is they're trying to stop you from doing exactly what Fiona said, which yeah. is interrogating it. Why, why, why? So if they can get you to act on an impulse or act because, you know, they catch you off guard, they're more likely to catch you out. So um, uh, I, um, this person had said, you know, what, what you do is you, you know, if it's going to be right, you need to do this in the next minute or next five minutes. Just don't. Don't do anything yeah. like that. Just don't let it go. Like before they called you, you didn't have a problem. So, yeah. you know, forget it. Um, but then the next thing to do is to uh, ask somebody else. So if you're unsure at mm -hmm. all about talk to somebody else who you trust and say, look, I just got this text message or I just got this phone call or I just mm -hmm. got this, you know, say, look, I'll get back to you. 
You know yeah. what I mean? So don't ever just react immediately and sign away something or, or do something. Yeah, and it is that, that and it's trying to instill panic in people, you know, when you do yeah. feel like have to react, you know. That that's you know, they, there there'll always be a scenario where, you know, I'm 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 in terrible trouble, you know, you have to save me now or else we're giving you this massive opportunity. But but you know, you know if if these things are real, they'll still be there, you know, an hour later, you know what I mean? Um so I think that was a big one for me because um after after I had heard that I noticed that every kind of scam I got you know sent that came my way had that sense of trying to catch you off guard and trying to make you react before you have time to think and realize that it's a scam and if you do get caught in something you know um what would you normally do like I know for example I had to I spoke in an earlier episode where I had to change my bank cards because I'd given bank details but what about things like passwords and about mm -hmm. you know resetting your computers are for what what do people do you know are there any practical um... well, you, you need to change your password fairly often and it, i know that's awkward because you want to you remember what it is and, and don't use the same password for every social network and your bank <laughs> and your because it it just uh it compromises the password i mean i i have a way of going into my computer and it'll say all of these passwords have been compromised on the site where it's been hacked. And I'm looking at them going, my God, it would take me a week or two to go through and change all of these. But so you have to be really careful. The, the, try and make it a difficult password. Don't use things like password or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, try and think of a string of characters you might remember. So, for example, if you were born in 1943, you could have B43 and then a symbol like a hyphen. And then if you were married in 67, you could have M67 and then maybe a forward slash. And then uh, maybe your initials, you know, if you were, um, uh, you know, Mary McCondron, you know, you could be MC. CC mm. or, you know, they're two, they're two alike, but, you know, pick different ones. So pick a string of number of le of digits, you know, letters, digits and symbols that are easy for you to remember, but are very difficult for hackers to break. Yeah, I, I have. Um, uh, I am probably like many other people who are listening at the moment, but I have a real problem remembering passwords. And I would be one of these people who for a long time have been using the same passwords. And um, I did even at one point have like a one, two, three, ABC, one, two, three, four, ABC, you know, very basic. Well, another, well, another tip about that is firstly, I think you need to have a lot of different passwords if you're on a lot of different things. Yeah. You need to have that in a file somewhere. So have a printed file in a locked Slate. drawer or somewhere or filing cabinet in your house and on your computer you can password protect that document so for example if i need my if my mac is in trouble and i need to bring it to somebody to service it i don't want them getting access to my document with passwords on it yeah. so i have it locked yeah yeah that's a but good the, good tip. the other thing as well is to um is to hide you know if you have to write stuff down don't just write it down you know like so for example um if there's a six if there's a six number if there's six numbers that I need I'll 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 make it into a phone number mm -hmm. so um I'll you know so just say it's six numbers I need for an account to do with my membership of a boat club or something like that I'll I'll say Billy Fisher you know Fisher has in boat and then 086 and then the six numbers so it just looks like Billy Fisher's phone number but mm -hmm. I know I don't know a Billy Fisher Fisher is boat so that's the boat club you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. So so hide it. So don't just don't just write the numbers down or don't write the numbers down. Hide it where you know. Yeah. But where anyone else just looks like a phone number. Yeah. You know. The the other thing I found with my cognitive decline as I'm getting older is if I make now this is what I've now been doing, which I think is fairly um, you know, it's the way I've got round that trying to remember numbers is I'll think of um, either a holiday destination or an occasion or something and I will write the name of the country, the name of the place, the year and then just with a height. Uh, Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. So I'm getting in your, you know, your numbers, your letters and your characters. Um, but it's something that I know that I'm going to remember. Um, so it's things like that, trying to something that will be easy for you, but quite difficult for anybody and else. That's another tip, actually, because sometimes now they're asking you for a symbol. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I'll make it an email address. 
because an email address looks like an email address, but it's actually a password. So Johnny67 at whatever.com looks like an email address, but that's actually the password because it's giving you your numbers, it's giving you your letters. Yes, and it's good tip. Well. Good tip. Now everybody knows only. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know my destinations <laughs> of holidays, hopefully. Um, so, I mean, we're coming to the end of what has been a very, very interesting series of discussions. And I know we could go on about this for so long and I know we haven't probably even touched the tip of the iceberg but I hope that it's been of some help to our listeners and you can go back again and again to look over these lessons um, and also we will be providing links to any of the um, organisations we've mentioned and also to the DISRA project um, which you can um, follow and get updates from. So thank you, Declan, and thank, thank you, Fiona. It's been a pleasure being involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you.